Hello scholars, my name is Dr. Kara Stillen and the goal of this channel is to make academic subjects easier to understand. Today we're going to talk about neurodevelopmental disorders and specifically intellectual developmental disorder. Now there are about six out of every 1,000 people born who have an intellectual disability. Intellectual developmental disability takes place during childhood, essentially during the developmental years. Sometimes it can be diagnosed with a child being about two years old, and then other times it takes a little while until the child is about five years old. In order for a person to be diagnosed with this disorder, they have to fit three different criteria and all three of them have to be observed. So the first criteria has to do with deficits in intelligence, or essentially that ability to learn. Now, intelligence is seen by uh, grade school teachers, high school teachers, middle school teachers. Um, the, the things and items that we teach are problem solving, organization, planning, reasoning, hypothetical thinking, abstract thinking, and we would have grade appropriate material for each age group. So it's pretty easy to ask a teacher, is my child working up to grade level? And they could pretty easily tell you yes or no, or things that they need help or assistance on. The second criteria has to do with deficits with communication or socialization. Um, does, can the child live independently as much as they can com as compared to their age group. If I have a six-year-old and they can dress themselves without any problems, um, don't seem to have issues running down the stairs, pouring their own cereal bowl and eating. If I've got a bunch of six-year-olds that are able to do that and I have another child who comes downstairs and will have nothing to do with it, they don't even seem to understand the concept of cereal, there's probably some deficits there. We just don't really know what they are right away. We will also look at, do these deficits appear at home? Do they appear at school? Do they appear on the playground, within the community, at work, if that child later works? It's important to see if something is going on at home that may not not be going on somewhere else. Now, usually when the issue is going across the board with a lot of different environments, that's kind of easier because we know something is not happening throughout all those different situations. Now, the third criteria is quite simple. The child just needs to be developing or the adolescence just needs to be developing. And that essentially is the third criteria. Now, in the past, I recognized that the label used for intellectual disabilities was mental retardation. That is no longer used. This was changed for two reasons. One, there was a terrible social stigma on it, but the law changed as well, and this is called Rosa's Law. So we don't use that terminology anymore. When it comes to intellectual disabilities, we do scale the disability. So professionals do categorize intellectual disability using this criteria, mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And we're gonna go through what each of those looks like given different children in different scenarios. When deciding whether someone is mild, moderate, severe, or profound, Professionals are not supposed to just use IQ scores to do this. If you come across somebody who's only using IQ scores and is dictating that a child is mod, mild or moderate, run. This is not a good situation or a good professional situation. They're supposed to use more of an adaptive functioning when looking at intelligence as well as how well the child does within their social world at home, um, in their learning world, we need to be looking more at the full picture here. So we're going to look at the adaptive functioning, which means how are they socializing? Are they independent? Can they learn the traits that make them independent? All of these are important. And can they eventually function independently within the community? Essentially, 
we're going to be asking that question. If they do have intellectual disability, how much help will this person need in the future? For the mild domain, parents and professionals may not see any difference with a child when they're in the preschool years, and preschool is generally three to four, sometimes two and a half, just all depends. The difference, though, will probably start to surface in the elementary years when children are first beginning to learn how to read. They're having numbers introduced and the addition and subtraction of those numbers. Um, a child with mild, within the mild domain may have some trouble with this. They may be a little bit slower than other children their own peer group age. These children may have trouble with telling time or counting small amounts of money. When a child needs support in one or more area, this is when we go ahead and diagnose the child with a mild intellectual disability. Now, as the child moves into adulthood, if they still are following the same kind of trajectory, it's typical to see an adult as having issues with higher level thinking, planning, understanding one's own priorities, and just basic cognitive functions. They may need assistance with money, the accounting of that money, and knowing how to spread it out or use it effectively to pay their bills. With mild implications, a professional or parent might see some immaturity issues. The child may have trouble interacting with peers that are the same age. They could be emotionally triggered or tend to have a lot of tantrums or such. Every kid is different and they're going to communicate their feelings through the way that they move their body. Other peers will probably notice a difference between themselves and that child, and they may have some kind of push off from that child because they don't tend to like that. There may also be issues with taking risks or not understanding the dangers of taking these risks. Usually individuals with mild intellectual disorder will do just fine when they have help or assistance with their personal care. In adulthood, they may also need assistance with paying bills, grocery shopping, preparing their food or self hygiene, like brushing their teeth. These children do best in jobs. Eventually when they grow up and become adolescents and are looking for jobs, look for jobs that are not cognitive based. Okay, in the moderate domain, you'll see a big difference with children falling behind. Um, within math and reading and arithmetic. Um, it will feel to the teachers or the people that observe them that they are very slowly catching on to these concepts. Um, the child may look over at their children's papers and maybe try to copy some because they can tell that they're falling behind. They're going to fall behind with reading, counting money, math, and especially writing. Um, be careful with your boys. Boys are going to have a rough time writing no matter what. A lot of the times their fine motor skills haven't been real attuned. Um, if you have grandchildren that aren't in school yet, please give your boys because they have larger fingers. They really need to work hard on that fine motor dexterity because when they're asked to write in school, that sometimes becomes problematic for them and we don't want as teachers to to worry about there being an intellectual disability because someone is struggling with their writing. Generally, adults will have skills that remain at the elementary school level. So they hit about fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and that's about where they stop. Sometimes they can get seventh, eighth grade, but they just can't seem to move on from there. These individuals will need support all their lives when it comes to cognitive activities. In comparison to their peers, there are significant differences socially and academically. These adults will tend to not want to write as much because communication will be their easiest form of socialization. They will tend to socialize most with a few friends and family that they feel comfortable with. They may even come upon a romantic relationship, but that tends to be more rare these individuals will need significant help with tons of different skills within their lives. They can usually help out with household activities, but they will require assistance with that, maybe even the reminder that that needs to happen. Money management is definitely needed and unproductive behavior 
may be present and that's where somebody watching over can dictate a hey, this needs to be done now otherwise you aren't going to get this this or this so in the severe domain there's really little understanding of the written word and of numbers and how they relate with one another time and money are nearly impossible to understand so these individuals need extensive help cognitively in their world their language will be very limited and sometimes to just speaking one or two words the kind of neat thing i think is that they live in the present moment they're not concerned usually about the future or the past most individuals these individuals will understand only basic communication again they'll tend to have the best time when they're with their family and friends they'll show the most enjoyment but severe individuals will need absolute help when it comes to bathing eating dressing going to the bathroom and supervision is needed at all times and in rare instances sometimes persons will self injure but thankfully this tends to be more rare now within the profound domain everything is really about the present moment and symbols or symbolism is nearly impossible for these individuals to grasp they may grab objects for self play or to play with or attempt to work with um, maybe you can even get individuals to the point where they can play simple matching games um, but sometimes that can't even be accomplished individuals with profound impairments may not be able to move effectively or care for themselves tends to be impossible this individual may have simple gestures that show pleasure or a lack of pleasure they always almost always love spending time with family and friends um, they can laugh with um, and be a part of the things that are going on in the household but they just have to have complete support for their physical care health and safety these individuals that have profound intellectual disabilities may enjoy watching movies they possibly can take small walks many individuals may like swimming but they also have to have assistance with them during this and they may love listening to music so when we are testing to see if there's an intellectual disability verbal comprehension will be tested so we'll look at a host of different factors such as abstract thought memory reasoning and cognitive factors those are essentially tests of intelligence and they can show us what grade level that a person is at people that administer these tests need to be clinically trained with professional judgment to properly know what the test results state and what they mean in regards to the child or the adult. The child's first language should be taken into consideration as well as any sociocultural pertinent background information. Now the second part of testing involves both a clinical professional evaluation and then what are called culturally appropriate standardized measures. So when a clinician goes to gather standardized measures, concerning this individual, they will look toward the parents, teachers, medical doctors, school files, mental health evaluations, and kind of put this information all together to see a bigger picture. They'll look at the academic domain, the reading, the writing, the arithmetic, common sense, problem solving, how quickly it took to gain different concepts or how they struggled with that. The social domain will also be gathered. And that what that means is does the child, is the child aware of people, people's feelings? Do they have empathy towards situations? Um, can they guess what other people's thoughts are? Do they have certain judgments in social situations? Then lastly, the practical domain addresses self-management across a wide variety of environments. So we need to see if the home life, the job life, the social life, and the school life, um, can the person care for themselves in all of those different facets? Now, many of us want to better understand where intellectual disabilities come from. And so researchers have gone on and have studied where these may have arisen from and so they created a list and said they can come from genetic syndromes chromosomal disorders 
problems with metabolism, environmental problems where alcohol, drugs, or toxins were introduced, any type of poison to a prenatal situation is called a teratogen. These these children might have had brain malformalities or the mother contracted a maternal disease. Um, issues can also come up in labor and delivery events that were problematic. After the birth, there could have been brain trauma of some sort. The child may have a seizure disorder, toxic metabolic syndrome, toxic metabolic syndrome, intoxications, um, chronic social deprivation, can even cause some of these issues. So when an intellectual disability is assessed, it's important to explore genetic and non-genetic etiologies. Other conditions like cerebral palsy or seizure disorder can impact um, whether or not somebody is diagnosed. Acquiring and studying a medical history, a history of the family for three generations, a genetic evaluation, a physical exam, and metabolic screening are important. If it, now, if a genetic condition is found, a diagnosis of intellectual developmental disorder put, should probably not be made. So there's two terms that I want you to know in reference to intellectual developmental disorder. These two are called global developmental delay and unspecified intellectual disability. Now the first one, global developmental delay, is used for individuals under the age of five when the clinical severity level cannot be diagnosed properly. So there might be an issue that has come up where milestones have not been met, developmental milestones have not been met, but the children may be too young to participate in standardized testing or their parents can't gather enough information or they haven't been in a school system long enough to know if they're really truly having problems with math, reading, and their level. Is it mild? Is it moderate? It, sometimes it just takes a couple years to really gather information about that child. So they'll put that in the category of global developmental delay. The other one, unspecified intellectual disability, this is for children that are over five years old. They have either physical or sensory impairments that make it difficult to know if there is an intellectual disability. They may have problems with their teeth or tongue that make it difficult for them to form words. They may have blindness um, or deafness that has led them to being behind in the development of words or associations with the environment around. So it's important that we have categories like this, unspecified intellectual disability, because this within the brain, that child could be functioning, you know, as well, if not quicker than other peers their age. It's just a matter of figuring out um, over time if there really truly is a disability there. So those are those two. Well, that is the end of our video. Please click the like button if you'd like to see more. Also, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you have other family members, I need help with subscribers after I lost my whole bunch of it to some woman who took over my channel. So I'd really appreciate anybody and everybody that can subscribe. I am grateful that you are finding um, quality to these. I hope you are going to do amazingly well on your tests. I care about each and every one of you and I care about our nation's mental health and our world's mental health. So in the next video, we'll be looking at developmental disorders, specifically communication disorders. Have an amazing day.